Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's time once again for Health Talks with Dr. Trin. The one show, maybe the only show that shows you the path to a healthier life, one conversation at a time. And today we're going to pick up a common thread we've carried with us through numerous shows here. We're going to talk about seniors and the dangers of falling. And to talk about that and uh, uh, illuminate the topic for us, we've got, uh, is it Dave Regal? Yeah, Dave, Dave Regal. Regal, okay. It's, it looks like Regal, but I'll, I'll That's say it quickly. Dave Regal. <laughs> well, Dave, welcome to uh, Health Talks here. Give us a little idea of what you do in your background, and then we'll talk more about it here. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And uh, thank you. And thanks, Dr. Trent, for having us on. I got into fall prevention about 10 years ago. I just turned 67. So I'm starting to get into the personal experiences of aging. And I'm glad I got into this industry. I'd done, I had a different company in the Midwest for 25 years. I did energy conservation, and that was great and all that. And sold that in 2011. And 2013 or 14, about 10 years ago, I got into fall prevention. And uh, my mom had suffered from a really bad fall before I got in this business. And it did not take me long to connect the dots and realize once I got into this, I had hundreds of meetings with seniors. And I, I started to hear all these stories about falls and boy, the bug got me. And so I moved here to Orange County and the, the resources out here are so incredible that I started to expand our reach and what we can do for clients. And it's an exciting ride out here. This is quite a needed product. We're an aging population. Absolutely. So I, I'm, I share your experience and your age. I'm 67 myself. And as I've detailed on this show and others, uh, went through three times the final journey here with my mom, my dad, and my mom's late sister who never got married, my aunt. I'm an only child, so it fell to me all three times to take care of each of them as they went through their final final phase here and eventually died and uh, watched them living alone as uh, up until the very end in my aunt's case uh, and the, the panic, the problems, the fear that that caused in them and me taking care of them remotely. I didn't live with them there. I'm wondering, right. did my dad fall? Did my mom fall? Did my aunt fall? And boy, did they fall. They fell a lot. And uh, I just remember the words of my father's doctor. Who uh, My father was a World War II uh, bomber pilot, grew up in the greatest generation, overcame everything, poverty, the depression, World War II, big, tough, rough guy. Uh, what killed him eventually was the fall. And his doctor warned him years before and said, I can do everything. My dad had uh, a stroke, no problem. My dad had uh, heart bypass, no problem. But as the doctor said, he, he had uh, leukemia, blood cancer, no problem. But what the doctor told me, he said, I can't, I can't uh, handle is if you fall. Because one, it just really upsets your whole body. Two, it takes a long time. You break a hip, you break a leg, something like that. And three, he said, I, I just, I can take care of everything except I've got pills or procedures or ideas except if you fall. And I thought that was an overstatement on his part. And for years, my father and I would, my father was just such a practical guy. And my dad lived to be in his 90s and he lived alone after my mother died. And he would say to me, I wonder what I'm going to die from. He would say, it's just like that. And I'd say, dad, we're not going to talk about this. And it's just Finally, I, yeah. you know, kiddingly told him, I said, I, I think you're going to get hit by a train. So just avoid train tracks. I mean, I just, I saw a vision. Dad, so just, <laughs> you know, just to shut him up, he'd laugh. But in the end, I mean, literally my dad went through heart problems, cancer, uh, strokes, all that stuff. That's not what killed him. What killed him is he was trying to pull a loaf of bread out of the freezer that had stuck and he yanked on it and it gave way and he fell backwards and hit his head on the counter and immediately oh, his brain sorry. swelled, immediately went into uh, emergency. His girlfriend at the time, he'd, he'd found a girlfriend down the street who was equally in her 90s. She found him on the floor, uh, rushed him to the hospital, and he didn't die right away. It took a couple of months in and out of consciousness. His brain would swell. His brain, and honest to God, he died from a fall trying to pull a loaf of bread out of the refrigerator. So I'm very sympathetic to this conversation and very familiar with the frustration 
that happens to both the caregiver and the one who is um, you're taking care of. Talk about that disconnect, how we deny that this is really that big of a deal. Oh, there's bigger issues to deal with than falling. I don't think so. Well, I couldn't get my dad to put in a grab bar. <laughs> and I'm in the industry. Yeah. I mean, it's denial. And, you know, we all think, I, I've heard it a million times, I don't need that yet. Yes, right. Exactly. Well, it's never been funny. And I go to events and people are going by on a walker, they can barely move and they're saying, I don't need it yet. Mm -hmm. I, You know, I'm a Marine. I, Well, we're not going to wake up tomorrow and be 21 again. No. It's just not going to happen. It's in almost all cases, our mobility is going to decrease, not increase. And so that's what we do when I'm in, when we do a home assessment and we're looking at someone's home and they, if they want to stay there the rest of their life, mm -hmm. got to make some changes. And most and, do, but my, my mom was the yeah. first one. I, I'll give you, I'll give you just the other quick parameters here. And we'll talk about yeah. all three of these as examples of what you're talking about. So my dad, big, rough, tough guy didn't want to hear about falling, didn't want to take any measures to prevent falling. Falling was, huh, that's, that's one, it's no big deal if I fall because I'm rough and tough, I'll just get up. And two, right. uh, I got bigger problems, bigger issues. Falling sounds like for little kids or something here. I, my dad, I'm falling. So he, he had a pride about it. My mother lived the last years of her life in constant fear of falling. She had Parkinson's disease. Yeah. So she shook very hard. And as the more she shook, the more she got embarrassed, the more she got wobbly, the more she got unstable. And eventually she even got a dementia out of it. And all of those things, just the one problem we were all worried about is her falling because she did it all the time. She broke her nose. She broke this. She didn't break anything like a hip or anything, but she broke stuff all the time because she fell all the time. She was unstable. And then it got to the point where she was frightened to even get up, which only exacerbated how weak she was. She wouldn't get out of bed. She wouldn't right. get out of a wheelchair. She wouldn't walk or do anything simply because she'd fallen so many times. She was afraid of that next fall that became an overriding fear in her life. And then in my aunt's case, her sister's case, she saw this with my mom. She saw this with my dad. She was the last of the Mohicans to go. And, uh, she died a couple years after my dad in her nineties. And she was fiercely independent, like all of them, never had any children, lived alone her whole life, did well. And the last years of her life, here's what she would do. This is crazy. She would get panicky in the middle of the night, always in the middle of the night, like two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. She'd get up. She yeah. couldn't go. She was, uh, she was sleepy. She was disoriented. She had to go to the bathroom and she would try and go and she couldn't, or she'd, uh, she'd get unstable and she would call the police. She would call the police and the police, she'd say, help, I can't get up. And the police would come literally break down her door and break the lock, force the way in, get her up. And then she'd say, oh, thank goodness. And then she'd say, now what? And they'd take her to the hospital and the hospital would say, what do you want us to do? You're 92. I can't keep you here forever. There's nothing wrong. I can't give you a pill to stop you from falling. She was overweight. She was, she had a blood cancer that made her very weak. So if we can't change these factors, you're going to be weak and you're going to do, you need to go somewhere. And they'd call me up and, and everybody would call me up and I'd either race out there or I'd be talking to long distance because I'm two hours away. They're out in Palm Springs. And right. I would say to her, we get these big fights and I say, you got to do something. And then the next morning, it's fine. It's okay. And I would say, w until the next time. I mean, I literally would hide the key and tell the police, okay, the key's here. Quit breaking down the door. And the police kept saying, quit calling us. We're not here just to pick her up and put her on the toilet. That's not our job. Yeah. She tried the fire department. She tried other sorts of people. And for about a, about a couple hours, she'd say, I'm going to do something. Now, the problem was compounded by the fact that, that wasn't an easy question. She didn't have any money. She didn't have a house. She didn't have any kids. So the normal vehicles you used to put them into long-term care didn't exist. She didn't have the money. And so it would fall on me and I'm not sure I had eight, 10,000 a month or whatever to, to put towards this either. Sure. But you know, we would debate it. We discuss it. You, you want to come in and move with me? No. And that wasn't easy. So I wasn't pushing that because then I got to quit work or some, my wife's got to stay home. Who's going to stay home and take care of my aunt all day and watch her just to make sure she doesn't fall. And she didn't like that. We didn't like that. And so she would stay in her house and then she'd call me up again and in, in a panic. I'm frightened. I can't get up. And I say, what do you want me to do? I can't change your situation. 
There's nothing that's going to fix it. Uh, you need, do need to go somewhere, somehow, here, there, somewhere. You finally eventually put her into a board and care facility, which is the most cost-effective. And when I did, she called me every four-letter word I'd ever heard of in my life. My sweet aunt, who I didn't think knew these words, called me every one of them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you dirty rat for doing this to me. And she died a couple months later, almost like gave up her will to live simply because yeah. it made her feel safe finally. And it did keep her safe, but it killed her will to live, I'm convinced, uh, because she was no longer on her own, in her own apartment. Um, you know, lots and lots to unpack in there, but I've seen this from multiple things. I've seen where the fear it can immobilize you. I've seen an old man that yep. said, ah, I'm too tough and rough. I'm a big, tough guy. I'm never going to fall, and who cares? To my aunt, who did fall and was frightened, but was more determined to live alone than to find a reliable solution to a, a caregiver, partly for money and partly just for pride. So talk about all of that. All these things that lead us in our final days, the number one issue was falling for all three of them. Well, you mentioned independence quite a few times yeah. in the last five minutes, and I hear that all the time. And, and we we pitch that because that is what our products can do. It keeps people independent. But more and more, I've seen how it can drag not just the person down, but everyone around them, a lot of people around them. I had a lunch with a wonderful young lady. I think she's probably 50 years old, very professional on Monday. And she was telling me she basically changed her whole career for the worse to be able to be near and flexible yep. to take care of her father. So she can't take a job where she's got to be gone for the week. Right. Can't do it. It's really limited her, her choices the last 20 years. And I hear so a lot. We've had people on independence who, there. We've literally had people who uh, moved back home to the detriment of their marriage, to the detriment yeah. of their job. But, to out of determination, I love my mom or dad. And I'm going to be there as they have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or, or something else. And somebody needs them there. They don't need me all the time, but when they do, someone's got to be there. And not everybody can afford a full-time caregiver. You're going to spend a hundred thousand dollars a year just to have somebody right. stand by. My dad used to get so frustrated with my mom. I'd say, why don't you get somebody to watch her for a while? So you can just go out. And he tried it once or twice. And he was so upset. He said, I'm paying somebody $25 or $30 or whatever it was an hour to sit there and watch television waiting that she might need to go to the bathroom or she might need something. For the most part, yeah. you don't do anything but sit around and wait. And then the crisis happens, the panic happens, the problem happens, and then you need somebody. You need to be there. You need to rush over yourself or you need to have somebody on call or there to take care of these things. So it's a lot of, it's a very expensive process to, provide somebody a companion, a caregiver. I was just watching this this morning in, um, read the political news like I always do. For those of you living in Southern California, we're all aware of the problems that uh, our Senator Dianne Feinstein is having. She's been a popular and beloved Senator, but she's 90 something now. And you know, many of us question whether she should still be serving or doing anything because she seems kind of out of it. She's wheeled around in a wheelchair. She's gone for months on end. And she's going through, I didn't realize she's going through a debate, or not a debate, a fight. Her daughter and her stepchildren are fighting over her late husband's estate now. He's a billionaire. And part of it is the estate has stopped reimbursing the mother, Diane Feinstein, for a full-time caregiver, which costs them like $200,000 a month. She has a full-time person who wheels around, watches her, takes care of her, like you would think somebody in her stature and income. And right. And the stepdaughters and the daughter are fighting over who's going to pay for this. Even at that level, who's going to take care of, and she's a United, she's still a United States Senator. <laughs> you know, this is mind boggling. This is, so even at that level, we're arguing and, and we can't debate or discuss, God knows what they do to keep her from falling. I guess they give her a full-time caregiver, but this is, this is a real issue. Is it just because we're living longer? Is it just because of the cost? I, I think because? it's what I think you just nailed it. You know, we didn't used to live this long. 1950, age expectancy in this country was 59. Yeah, wow. Today it's closer to 80, up and down a little bit. Right. 
but our houses weren't made for 80, 90, 100 year old people. Yes. Right. That's what we, when we go in and look at a house, the first thing we look at is always the bathroom. Yes. That's where <laughs> seniors tend to fall. They have, they get scared. I've, I've met people with a lot of money and they haven't had a bath or a shower in two or three years. They yes. sit and sponge bathe. For real. Again, yeah. right. afraid to get in. They're afraid to get out of an old bathtub, any number of things. My aunt, right. Yeah. And she and, would, I'm sorry to say, she would smell and not just because she yeah. went to the bathroom and gave up and tried to use diapers or whatever and just, I'm not even going to go. I'm just going to go in my pants. But then she wouldn't change the diaper and everything. This is a, a well-respected, regarded woman, a uh, very yeah. classy lady. And she smells like because she doesn't go to the bathroom or change her because she's frightened. She's frightened to yeah. do that or incapable of doing that. See, that's the part we can help. And a lot of what we've talked about all revolves around the problems after somebody has fallen. Yeah. Now we can't prevent them all. We can't, there's no way, right. but we can sure knock out a bunch of them. Yeah. I've told a story. I, I was part of a study council on aging did 10 years ago in Indianapolis, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And it was a volunteer day and I sponsored part of it. And at any rate, a uh, hundred houses in Indianapolis Volunteers went and swamped them in a day and cleaned up the houses and different things like that. And the guys who could do it would install uh, grab bars, right? one or two of them. And this didn't cost the people anything. Well, the, the lady I worked with from Sokoa went back a year later. Now, this was unofficial. So she told me, I can't really, it's not going to be written up. But right. she'd gone back and, and asked all the people in those hundred houses a year later, one or two grab bars had cut falls by 84%. Wow. I about flipped. Wow. I couldn't believe it. They cost not much at all. Right. In in a hundred houses. That's meaningful. So let's talk so, about this a little more because I we used yeah. to do a show with a guy named Rod Gantos. He's about our age, a little younger, maybe in his late fifties. And his he he had a little side gig. He he was a designer. He did high end homes and stuff here. He would people to design redevelopment. You know, we're all staying in our houses longer, so suddenly we want it to be bigger, beautiful, or whatever. And yeah. he said that was part of the problem is that these houses that were bought, designed for a family, are now being the kids have moved out and the parents are still there, aging in place, as we say all the time. Right. They don't want to go anywhere else. They can't afford to go anywhere else. They don't want to go anywhere else. Uh, they don't want to go into assisted living. They can't afford to go into assisted living. They don't want to move. They want to just stay here. And so these houses are being asked to do something they weren't designed to. They have stairs. They have toilets that are too low. They don't have grab bars. Let's walk through some of the things. These They have counters that are too low. Uh, and so all of these things then leads you to it was okay when you had kids in a family but now you need a different setup otherwise you're reaching you're trying you're yeah you're doing all these things to accommodate the house and the house wasn't built with that in mind at all i i've seen some really odd designs here in california and beautiful stuff but a lot of tile bathrooms i mean it's like walking on ice yes. i don't get that at all a lot of the showers will have steps in that are six, seven inches high, which a lot of seniors can't do safely. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of them, no grab bars. You got a wet, slippery surface. Or in the wrong place, the grab bar is somewhere. You know, how am I supposed to grab that up here? Around? Right. I'd have to twist around to grab it, you know. People will use a towel. They'll hang on to a towel bar. That that's dumb. I've seen lots of them hanging there loose. They're, I, those are not grab bars. I've done that a couple of times, getting out of the tub in my own house, and there's not. Yeah. I don't have a grab bar. As dumb as that sounds, because I I'm 67. I'm doesn't. I don't need a grab bar. And the other day, I grabbed something. And I thought, boy, if I slipped, and I feel like I'm slipping. That's why I'm trying to grab something here. It's a towel rack. That thing come but down. It, could, it could just as well be a grab bar. Yeah, right. There are grab bars that look like towel racks. Yeah. For that exactly. purpose. Right. None of this is expensive. That was Rod's point. A lot of this redoing bathrooms in particular, you're not talking about big, the money we spend on redoing our kitchen cabinets, you know, pails in comparison, the That's home right. makeover stuff, 
to some of this simple, sensible stuff. Bathrooms in particular. Let's talk about, how about toilet heights? When we had new toilets installed, I decided to go with the taller toilet, the one that sits up higher. And everybody laughed at me. Yeah. How do you like it? Why would I ever all the way down so I got to push all the way back up to get off the toilet? It's nuts. Why did, I don't know why all toilets aren't like that. That's how grab bars are. Once you've got grab bars there to hold on, you use them every time you use the shower or every time you're in the bathroom, you just do. I put them in hallways or or railings. It's something to lean on is a good thing. But yeah, the grab bars, the one thing I will say is anybody who's got these stick on suction cup grab bars, those are really a joke. My wife I, tried I, buying I, one I of those. I believe the first time I saw those on a shelf, and I thought, "Are you kidding me?" Yeah, my aunt, wife actually bought one. She was going to put it in the in the. Yeah, I said she saw it on, you know, some thing and sent for it. So wow, it's cheap, and I'll just a suction cup. I said that's not going to work. They dry out if you don't use them for a few days. Sometimes they'll fall off the wall on their own. Yeah. Right. It's one thing if you're going to steady yourself. It's another if you're diving and you need something there. Right. You don't want to wake up with a grab bar in your hand. So grab bars are one. Toilets, replacing the toilets with higher seats is another. So you don't have to squat down as far and push yourself back up as far. Uh, It's easier to get on and off. What are the things? Uh, Tile. We all have tile in our bathrooms and the tile is like ice. I don't know why we, what are the, what can we put there other than tile? Because you don't want water, you don't want carpet, so you don't. On something that's waterproof. There, there's different types of flooring. I, I can't get into all that, Paul. I'm not an expert on different types of flooring, but there are plenty around that are slip resistant. Plenty. I don't see, so, I can't think of, even in my parents' house and then my aunt's apartment, I can't think of anything that wasn't slippery on the floor. We've all gone to these fake, uh, look like wood planks, but they're really I don't know, there's yeah. some kind of plastic laminates and stuff here. And they look and they're impervious to drops and mold and everything else. But they are, they're slippery. If you put, especially you get water on them yeah. here. Well, we, we start in the bathroom. Almost all of our business starts with replacing an old traditional bathtub. Right. Anybody right. trying to get over a 15, 16 inch tub wall, mm-hmm. it's an accident just waiting to happen. And then you're standing and trying to stand up and go all the way down. And, you know, my father finally gave in and started taking showers late in life. He hated that. He, cause he was a bath guy. Ah, my aunt too. She just loved getting down into bathtub, but, but the act, not only getting over the counter, but the act of putting her whole body down and then slippery standing back up, her legs were weak. She couldn't, she couldn't right. lay down and stand up, even particularly on a slippery surface, particularly with no grab bars. Yeah, we put in uh, low step showers that have maybe a one inch threshold to get in or none. Yeah. So, you know, it's when she would problem. go to the hospital, her favorite thing, and they keep her overnight. And then I go pick her up the next day and, and I'd go pack her a few little things. They always put her in a handicap shower, which had no threshold to it. You could roll right. in with a wheelchair. As my mother was in a wheelchair, that's what my uh, parents uh, looked at doing. Never did, but uh, uh, putting in a ro- rolling thing. The same thing. I'll tell you the other thing that shocked me about my par- about all three cases. I wasn't ready for falling. They weren't ready for falling. None of us, that wasn't on the radar screen. Cancer, heart, or big issues. That's what we were all worried about. The second thing was the fear that comes with all of this, the fear of falling and everything, how immobilizing that is and how that leads to more falls, all of these things. And, and just what you're talking about, how uh, the house wasn't set up. My mother would love to open the drapes, and but they had furniture in front of the window, the bay window. Yeah. So she would lean way over to pull the drape down and now she's way overextended. I mean, she fell so many times doing it. I was like, get rid of the furniture or move it out, or why do we come up with motorized things or something else? Why are you still trying to pull down the drapes and pull them up, leaning over uh, this couch, this uh, table or something? I mean, recipes for disaster. So that shocked me. But here's the other thing that shocked me the most about watching my parents and my aunt get older is how a one-inch barrier, anything that you bumped into became a giant uh, hurdle became a precipice for a fall. 
my father would fall. Uh, she'd go to the supermarket and there was a wet mat. What do we call those rubber mats in front of the grocery, sure. in front of the uh, vegetable because they spray this stuff down. That mat would bunch up a little bit. He went down a couple of times. Any yeah. sort of threshold my mother would have to come to, she'd stop and panic. How am I going to lift my foot over that one inch into the doorway or that onto the curb or across some of these minor little things that we don't give second thought to become giant hurdles and vision. causes People, the falls. Yeah, our vision degrades. We that that leads to falls of vision, yes. hearing loss, balance. These things all tie together, your muscles atrophy, even your feet, the muscles in the bottom of your feet atrophy over time. So you're not standing on the same base you did 20 years ago. Right. And I'll give you a couple others that I've noticed. I almost fell the other day in uh, my garage because I've got bifocals and somehow in the poor yeah. light, I didn't, I misjudged the step and I missed it. And that one step I stumbled and my wife came, what's the matter? I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm just using every gd word i can think of here i mean how feeling so stupid i missed the step i misjudged the step in the dark trying to walk back because there's a step from our garage up most garages are lower uh right. set down and i'm stepping up into the house and i thought how ridiculous here it's starting again it's the same things i saw with them my father always uh, said his doctor said that your inner ear balance goes out over time for most people it's just a yeah. natural thing so you're your inner ear determines your balance. That's a little off. Your sight is a little off. And of course, in my mom and dad's case, and my aunt's case, they gain weight, particularly my mom and my aunt, because they're inactive and their legs balloon up and they have all this edema that builds up in their legs because they're not moving. So the edema doesn't get, pumped, the, the fluid doesn't get pumped back up and they just start to balloon out. And then that becomes like weights on their legs. All this cycle that made it difficult to walk, that made it difficult yeah. to balance, that made it difficult. And they didn't want to adjust. They either stopped moving or they would still do the same thing, reaching for things, walking across surfaces, ignoring those little barriers and stuff. And that's what they stumbled and fell on all the time. And when you're uh, last thing I'll say this, I know I'm ranting and raving here, but I hope people oh, are listening, <laughs> um, is that when you can't go to the bathroom, you got a big problem. When you can't dress yourself or get up or feed yourself, the, the base, the essential things that they call the things we take for granted. Can you get up out of bed? Can you button your shirt? Can you go to the bathroom and wipe your butt? Can you do these, these simple little day-to-day -day tasks? That's when you're in trouble. That's when you have to go into a facility and somebody has to help you. And you think, I'm not going to pay somebody to walk me to the bathroom, but you need it. Or, or, and if you can't afford it or you refuse to do it or both, there's big problems. It was those issues that dominated my, all three of their yeah. later lights, not their cancer. We had that dialed in. We knew how to treat that, not their heart problems, not their uh, uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And we had procedures and protocols and pills and doctors and specialist for all of that. It was a problem, but we handled it. It was the day-to-day -day physical activities, bathing themselves, uh, going to the bathroom, yeah. getting up, and the constant fear of falling that, that dominated all of their lives the last five, 10 years of their lives. Well, I, I think my favorite product to sell is walk-in bathtubs, walk-in hydrotherapy tubs. See them on TV all the time. And the ones they... I think originated 15 or 20 years ago, had a lot of flaws in them. Right. These things have gotten pretty good now. I mean, you get in and you, you're taking a little jacuzzi bath, a spa right in your home. Right. The step to get in is two, three inches, got grab bars. Right. And you get in and it's where luxury meets safety. <laughs> Just yeah. enjoying yourself 20, 30 minutes a day. I, I, I uh, got my football coach one back in high school. I got him a tub a few years ago, and he was in it twice a day, he said. So those things are really good for circulation. You mentioned having foot and ankle and right. uh, problems with that, and that's one thing a walk-in tub can help a lot Yes, exactly. is circulation and achy joints, things like that. You feel better. You sleep better. It's a life changer for a lot of people. Yeah. 
all of that is true. So one of the things, we've got walk-in bathtubs. We've seen that. Uh, we've got grab bars. That's a simple solution. Higher toilets. Yeah. All of those are kind of in the uh, bathroom yeah. area. Showers, Getting rid of tile, tile, figuring out something other than tile there that's not as slippery. Uh, all of that's a, a necessary change if you want to stay in your house as you age. What else? When I leave the bathroom, what else? Um, beds? Well, uh, do yeah, I have to change the height of beds we, and stuff? And, I'm starting to do a lot more railings than before. Again, that's a California thing. I've been in homes that have, you mentioned steps. I yeah. see steps all the time, step up, step down, three, four inches. Right. Well, the tile matches in the house. Like you might come in the entrance of a house, mm -hmm. and next thing you know, you got to step down three or four inches, and you don't see it. No. I've been in houses, those things are throughout the house. Mm -hmm. You know, we can put little railings there, mm -hmm. things like that. Just things, if they're there, you're going to grab them and you're going to notice it. Mm -hmm. Just little things like that. We, I work with some partner companies that bring a lot of other resources. Uh, stair lifts is very popular yeah, right now. Right, yeah. The cost on those things have, have come way down over the years, so it's become a possible or a potential solution for a lot more people. So let's talk we, about one thing. Stay, uh, before my parents moved from the Midwest in their big house to California in their small single story house on Palm Springs, uh, late in life, they moved out here. We needed to be closer together. I'm not going back to Michigan. They're not coming. You know, they, they finally had to adjust and move out here so I could be closer. And right. when we sold the house in Michigan, the first thing the realtor did is say, oh, take that stair lift down that it gives it an air of death of old folks an old folks home. Uh, some young couple doesn't want to see a stair lift when they walk in. Is any of this stuff? Is yeah. That let me tell you, Paul, when somebody 85 asked me, well, what's this going to do for resale? I said, who cares? <laughs> really? You, you said you're going to carry you out of here, right? right. Who cares? Right. And uh, nowadays there's a, there's a ton of realtors that specialize with seniors people moving here from Michigan that don't want to go through putting in a new walk-in tub. They don't, they'd rather not have to deal with putting in a stair lift, even though they're not hard. A stair lift takes three hours to install. It was amazing. Yeah. Right. They Tubs to, and showers take one to two days, but yeah, there's. <laughs> so I, and that was this other guy, this Rod Gonto said, you know, there are ways today to design this stuff. It's getting better. It doesn't have to look like, a uh, right. uh, uh, sore thumb. It sticks out at you, That's this right. handrail, this grab bar, this something, yep. this different thing. It can be incorporated into design as if it was always there. That's called universal design. I learned, I went there to CAPS training, certified aging in place training, yeah. I think nine years ago, or it was a three day course. And they talked a lot about that sandwich generations, like you mentioned, where Grandma and grandpa are moving back with the kids, and now they've got kids. So you got right. three generations living in the same home, right. and the teenagers don't want the house to look, you know, nobody wants it to look like an institution. That's where right. things can be worked out, and it, nobody notices a difference. Will we ever start designing these houses different? For example, when I was a kid, this isn't. this is just to give you an example, I grew up in, I'm, we're both born in the fifties and grew up in the sixties as kids. Sure. Um, the dining room, the living room, these rooms that were absolutely had to have, nobody has them anymore. Nobody has a separate living room, a formal living room or a formal dining room anymore. Nobody I know, they all have these great rooms right. and whatnot. So housing designers have adapted to the demands of consumers and we've changed. The kitchens have grown, the kitchen, even my parents had a pretty decent, had a pretty big house uh, in suburbia. The kitchen was tiny. Nobody ever went in the kitchen. You just went there to make food. Now the kitchen is huge and people hang out there and there's islands and counters and stuff. So we have adapted dramatically the layout of the house. Will we ever get to a point or are we getting to a point where the people designing these houses saying, and if you buy this house, you can live in it for a lifetime? You know, that's a great question. I've heard about it, a development popping up here and there. I've never seen one. I've never seen I know one They're either. not commonplace yet. But as I started to say earlier, with the housing market and so many seniors still wanting to stay at home, you know, that that's a viable. It, the resale on putting these safety and accessibility things in is almost a positive now. Yeah, right. 
For yeah, I don't know why anybody, home. nobody would ever bothered the fact I've got taller toilets. That's I, nobody's going to say get rid of those. Um, yeah. it's a, I don't know why toilets were made so low in the first place. Why didn't they start <laughs> making them all tall? It's easy for everybody here. Right. I don't know why there aren't grab bars anybody because you can always slip and fall even if you're 30 or 20 or whatever or something here. Uh, it's slippery. Yeah. Um, so why that's a why that's a now a, uh, a, ooh we got to put a grab bar in there old that's different we're going to make it look weird. Uh, all of this I think I don't know why that universal design I've heard that concept before can't be incorporated from the moment the house is built. It would be so much easier to put in a stud and a, to know where the studs are and to put a grab bar in the minute you're building the house or rehabbing the whole bathroom, not later, where does it go and how do I fit it in and how do I match it and all that other consideration. It'd be so much easier to do it at the moment of inclusion. Yeah. I don't know how to answer that. I'm not sure how fast that trend will happen. Yeah. I think you're going to see more of it because my generation, our generation is not looking forward to, in fact, fighting more than my parents' generation I'm not going into a home. I'm not going into a nursing facility. I'm not going into long-term care. Not, not willingly, not you know, kicking and right. screaming. Uh, one, because of the cost. It's amazing, the cost of these things. You're looking at six, eight to $10,000 a month today to move into one of these yeah. facilities. Very expensive. Two, you don't get much, a little tiny room or a bed or whatever here. And yes, there's a million activities and you can meet people and I get the a positive and you're safe and everything. But it's a cost, and you don't you give up a certain amount of independence to do this, and just what it's it's just this notion in our head. I'm not just going to end up that way. Instead, I want to stay in my house. That's why they're trying to send people home early from hospitals. They save money, yeah. but they also speed up recovery. You're going to recover better in your house than I am sitting in a hospital bed. Uh, so all yeah. this trend is looking. I want to stay in my house for life. The house I live in today. I don't know what you bought when you came out here, um, but I'm assuming you had a house there and you bought a house here. And if you did, did you buy a house that was built for you? Probably not. It was built for young families a million years ago. Right. Here. Yeah. I, the house I live in was technically a starter home uh, 30 years ago. I just never got out of it. I raised my family and I sure. stayed. And now it's kind of come back. It's smaller and it's actually more convenient. I'm not trying to sell some McMansion that, and move back down into a house. I, I went through the cycle where I should have moved up and didn't. And then for whatever reason, and then now I'm back in a smaller, you know, 1500 square foot house here. And it's kind of the right size for me these days, but it has stairs. That's dumb. You know, it doesn't, yeah. it wasn't designed for me. It wasn't well, me in uh, mind. something we just now were able to start offering that I'm super excited about are fall alert devices. They've been around and the joke about, hey, I've fallen, I can't get up. Well, it's not really a joke. No. And pretty much anybody that lives alone should have one of these. You know, we have pendants, we have watches. It's like having a cell phone around your neck. Right. You were talking earlier about someone getting scared and calling people in the middle of the night. If, right. if someone's having an episode they can push the button on it and summon help, right? Just like that. Right. And if, other if things, they, what Dr. Trin has talked about this a lot. The future of these devices isn't just an alert that I've fallen or, or a communications device like you're talking about. It could be a right. monitor. It could be a monitoring device. It could monitor your blood pressure. It could monitor how many steps you take. Yeah. It could monitor whether you got out of bed. I wondered many days if my aunt even got out of bed. And, of course, she wouldn't tell me. Uh, did you take your pills today? She wouldn't tell me. Did you uh, get up and walk around? And if you did, how much? I suspect not much. And so, again, it can be a way of, of giving information to the doctor and the caregivers, what these people are doing in their day-to-day -day routine. How much did they move around? Where did they move? What, what their vital signs look like? All of that is remote monitoring these days. I don't know if any of your devices do that, but I think that's the future. Well, the technology is getting there. I haven't looked into it. I don't try to keep up on that yet. I don't have that many buyers for it exactly, but I think the technology, I looked at some systems 10 years ago that were pretty, pretty cool for monitoring someone in their house. So I know the technologies are there. I can't speak to it. I'm not sure what exactly is available now. Well, but, and there's a variety of, there was a product that won all sorts of awards here. They had them on one of our channels. I think it was called GrandPad. And it's like yeah. basically a big iPad, but it had been bulletized and 
you couldn't do and couldn't change too much. And it had two or three things you could, you could make a phone call on it, a video call on it. You could use it as a real phone. You could uh, dial up a certain amount of data, but for the, my aunt who couldn't wrap her head around computers and stuff, she just pushed I gave it to her. Uh, it wasn't that expensive in the last few years of her life. And she used it to watch things or to communicate or to take pictures. It had a little slide show that I could upload pictures yeah. and she could see pictures of the grandkids and stuff here. It was just a very simple um, bulletproof laptop that had a uh, communications link with a local phone. So you, you could do limited internet functionality with it. And it gave her some connection without having to learn all the intricacies of an iPad. I thought that was, a, there's a lots of these kinds of innovative products that people are coming up with right. for those living alone. Yeah, the alert systems we sell can do a welfare check where the, the monitoring system will call, the station will call someone if they haven't moved, let's say, for 10 hours. Right. And they normally do. That can trigger a call. See, that's Are brilliant. you okay? And then all they do is they press a button and say, no, I'm okay. I just forgot and I'd taken my alert off or right. something like that. So there's, there's some uh, features built in that way. The only person, th this is emphasize that point. My aunt was the last of the three that I took care of, the last to die, the last to go through this. And I always hate it when they say when she passed away or we lost her. Where did we lose her? No, we didn't lose her. I mean, I, we can't even use the word death anymore here. I mean, she died. She lived a good life and then she died. Right. And anyway, that's just a little pet peeve of mine. Um, in her final years living alone, I realized that the only person who ever saw her day in and out. She's two hours away from me, so I'm not seeing her every day. I try and call her every day. The only person to come visit her was Tony, the guy delivering her meals on wheels. Not only did that mean she didn't have to go to stores, she didn't have to cook, she got taken care of. There was a meal prepared for her every day that saved her, it was a lifesaver for her. Tony would stop and chat with her for five minutes. She looked forward to that. One person, that was the only person that came in all day long and, and yeah. the only human being she had an interface with. And then once a week, you know, once a, every other week, I'd come out and visit her. And that was it. Otherwise, she's a shut-in. She's a recluse. She sat and watched TV all day, uh, listened to the radio, whatever. She didn't have, there was nobody checking on her. There was nobody coming in. And I thought, how horrible. And, and it created a fear for her, too, that, you know, does somebody even know if I'm alive or dead? We find all the time these people yeah. have died. Nobody knows for three or four or five days till there's a smell in the place. Oh my goodness. I haven't really oh, seen some. That's the biggest thing I learned when we started to sell alerts. I researched them online a lot. Mm -hmm. And if people with an alert, your odds of getting found on the ground, you want to be found soon. Yes. You don't want to lay there two or three or four or five hours. And I read this people can die after two or three hours laying there if they never even got injured. They still Absolutely. can die from pressure sores, like bed sores, infections, uh, all kinds of, high, you know, they, they get cold, they get dehydrated, all kinds of things can happen, and it doesn't take long. If you get found within an hour, I think the statistic was 91% of the people go home from the hospital the next day. Right. You lay there three or four hours, it turns into, well, two weeks, and the mortality goes way up. You lay there eight hours and you're going to have a real problem. And the thing is, these things have GPS. Yeah. If you're out walking there around at night, they know exactly where you are. Exactly. And it triggers a call to your caregiver, you know, to EMTs and you got help, help immediately. Why not to wear one of those? I'll give you another ter terrible story. I'm sharing all my examples here because I want people to realize I've been through this and it's real now. You know, have I changed my life? No, because I don't need any of that now. I don't need grab bars. I don't need all this stuff. Bit by bit, I'm starting to realize I do. I'm going through some of the start in the early stages of all this, misjudging the step, uh, slipping in the tub, uh, all these things. Uh, slowly, I'm starting to think I do have to have a taller toilet and some other things. So here's another great, uh, terrible example, not a great example, but a perfect example for you. So my wife's parents lived alone back in Pennsylvania and her sister was nearby so that there was somebody to take care of them. And as they got older, they both eventually died at their house and um, the dad died first 
a heart attack or something, and then the mother is living on into her 80s, and it snows back there, and it's a multi-level house. One day, she went out just to pick up the new because she still got a newspaper. It was in the front. She had to open the door and pick up the newspaper. Yeah. She did that, and as she leaned over, it's snowing. She fell, and she fell into the bush. Thank goodness. It's cushioned her blow, but she's laying there in the bush, and she can't wiggle out, so she gives up even trying. She doesn't have a cell phone. It's snowing out. This 80-year-old lady is laying in a bush. This is in a suburban neighborhood, and nobody notices there's a lady just laying in the bush until her neighbors saw her, and she laid there for like an hour. And we were all horrified. Had she laid there much longer, she would have frozen to death on her own doorstep, picking up the newspaper. I yeah. mean, is that mind-boggling? I, that that almost killed her, because that simple daily activity she'd done for thirty years was now difficult at eighty years of age. And and Paul, well, just to interject, you mentioned that the cell phone. Um, many people use a cell phone as a GPS and and as an, and as an alert. But the problem is that not everybody carries the cell phone with them everywhere. So not out to get the, the newspaper. Up. Yeah, not to, not yes. to go to the bathroom. <laughs> right. And so, I mean, for the fall alert, because it has those wonderful features like the GPS, the you know, the wealth check. I mean, I highly, you know, like encourage even myself when I'm about and about at 10 at night networking, it has a button that I could quickly, you know, click on for help. And it dials all these numbers, depending on what I've entered into the system, whether it's my husband first and kind of trickles over to the next person, but it definitely has 911 or my doctor, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you another silly example. I'm going to bear all my uh, secrets here today here. So I'm 67. I work at the uh, University of California, Irvine's Beal Applied Innovation Center, this high tech center. And of course it's all biometric and it all locks itself down. We don't have keys anymore to get into the doors and everything here. And it the building locks totally at like 7 o'clock at night. I'm there the other night, a little later, 7.30. I walk to take, I go downstairs, I go out the front door of this three-story building, I go out to my car, I put something in there, and I turn and I go, oh, my God, the door has locked behind me. I fortunately had my cell phone, but n- normally I don't walk around with my cell phone when I'm at work. I have it sitting there on the shelf. I, I, there's no key to open it up. And I realized I can't get back in the building. My wallet is upstairs that had the little secret passcode, the, the, the fob that allows me in. And I'm outside the building feeling like an old fool. Cause I let, I walked out and let the door close behind me. Now, fortunately I had to have once before I have security on the phone. I called him up and said, Oh, it's me again. I walked out. I'm locked out of the building. Can you come over and get me? And they send over somebody to open the door. But had I not had the cell phone, what would I have done? My wife would be wondering where I am. Everybody be wondering where I am. I can't get into my, I can't, I don't, I, I guess I could drive home because I had the car keys, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I, or wait, or wait in the doorsteps like most kids get locked out. <laughs> yeah, like kids getting locked out. I felt like a little stupid kid that got locked out of the house. Here. And I thought, you know what, how stupid. I have to make sure I carry my wallet with me that has a little fob in it, the, uh, the little access card, and I have to have my cell phone with me, I could just as easily have not had either one of those. I'm just walked outside for a minute to get something, and all of a sudden the door locks behind me. But if I had, uh, now would I walk around with a little thing? No, I'm not too, uh, that's for old people. I'm not going to walk around with a little alert. Why not? Why not, If it particularly, it looked like a watch or something else? Watch. There? Yeah, why mm-hmm. yeah. Maybe we should all have these things on us here all the time. Because I, I just, I, that was just a brain fart. That was a brain mistake on my part here. And I do more and more of those at my age. And it's like, oh, my God, I could lock myself out of the house here. <laughs> you aren't the only one. I have hidden keys outside because I lock myself out of the house. And I know where to go get the key now so I don't have to break a window to get back in. Uh, but, you know, we are getting to a point where we have to recognize These are real things happening to us, misjudging the step, forgetting something, leaving something behind. And yet I'm no different than everybody else. That's for somebody else. That's for later, much later down the road. Hey folks, later's closer than you think. Let me tell you, we, 
I we partnered this year with Caduceus Medical. They have seven clinics in Orange County, and I learned a lot from the doctors there. And uh, the chief medical officers, Dr. Nick uh, Di Nicola, and he told me one out of four pregnant women fall. What? Who knew? Who knew? I never knew they that. They do a lot of work with women at Caduceus. Yeah, and Dr. Nathaniel. Makes sense because you can't. Nicola, you, you, yeah. you, you got a giant baby bulge. I can't see the step like I used to or whatever. I'm a little out of balance on my body. Right. I'm leaning forward. I have a weight in front of me here, you know, on and on and on. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it makes total sense. Well, right. since they partnered with us, now they screen their patients when they're in the office. They'll ask them questions about their fall risk. And if they're at high fall risk, then that triggers an assessment with us. We right. get an email and we can offer up a home assessment to the people at high fall risk. And what does that entail? So you walk out and what? You start eyeballing, oh, did you notice yeah, this? Did you notice it's, this? It's real custom. I've, I've been doing this for about a year now with home assessments. And really, we do them all the time without knowing it. Right. But sometimes it's five minutes. I go in and somebody can say, hey, I have a problem over here. Can we just do grab? Fine, that's good. And we can help with that. If they're not sure, then I can take a walk around, point out, well, we could do something here. We could replace this. And people can say, yeah, let's talk about that. Or no, I don't need to do that yet. Or things like that. That's what we do at a home assessment. We offer up some ideas that people maybe didn't have before. Mm -hmm. Any other things? You, you had the voice of Marisol appear here, your marketing person here. Uh, anything else, Marisol, or anything that we're Please, missing? Yes. And, and Dave just shared an old memory of my mom. And God bless her soul. She's already at peace. But she was pregnant with my brother we're five siblings and i remember coming out of a building i must have been eight and it's not raining hard but i know it had been the steps were definitely wet and we were coming out of a yeah. building with a lot of steps and she turns over she says mama make sure you grab onto the uh the the, the railing i don't want you to slip right when she's telling me that <laughs> she's pregnant and she's walking down the steps and I just see my poor mom slip and fall on her rear and go yeah. all the way down. Boom, I boom, felt boom, boom. horrible because, I mean, I'm eight. I, there's, there was nothing I could do. And I, she could have lost the baby. But, I mean, little things like that. And she was aware that we could have slipped. And she slipped. And I'm like, at, and back then we had no foam. Um, yeah, there's no, no phone. Models. What are you going to do? An eight-year-old's <laughs> panicked. The mother's down. She's hit her head. She can't get up. She broke her leg. She's in right. an emergency. Do this. This, ha this stuff happens all the time. I mm -hmm. was, I'll give you one more. Now we're, you're making these all come out. So not long ago, I still uh, inherited my parents' house out in the desert. I rented out uh, seasonally here. It's a beautiful house on a golf course. It has a pool. And so I don't go out that often. And I was out there the other couple of weeks ago getting the house ready for the next tenant. And my grandkids are with me and everything else. My wife's with me and we're going to enjoy it for a day. And I'm doing what I never do. I'm cleaning the pool. Oh, there's some leaves. So I'm going to go over, I'm going to get the leaf thing and I'm going to pull it out. I, I'm, I'm a tough guy. I can do this myself. And <laughs> as I did, my bifocals misjudged the edge of the pool. And there's like a step down into sort of a jacuzzi type of thing. And I was somehow trying to stand on that and reach out farther. It's always reaching that gets you in trouble. I'm reaching for something. I misjudged it and I went down into the pool, but in the process, banged the hell out of my leg and hit, hit my shoulder and Ouch. everything else. You know, I slipped and went bang, bang, bang into the pool. Now I'm in the pool holding my arm going, ow. And my grandson who's eight starts panicking. Are you okay? And I'm like, go get, go get grandma. You know? And I thought, my God, I could have drowned. I could have hit my head just as easily as hit my elbow for something stupid. I'm trying to clean the pool out. It's probably a little at dusk or something here, but I'm thinking I'm still 20 and I can do this. And I slipped and fell. Fortunately, it was okay. I just had a big, nasty bruise. It took days to go away here, but I could have easily broken something, hit something. And here I am with an eight year old trying to say, go get help uh. like your mother uh, and a pregnant. The, the, this uh. is not funny. It's not fun. Why don't, why is this not on our radar, Dave? I guess that's why, why are we fighting this? Why is this something that, we all have these experiences, but then we just go, I made it. 
on to the next. I don't need to think about any of this stuff. I don't need to change I, anything. I think it's what we talked about 10 minutes into this. It, it just, it's denial and planning ahead. Our parents didn't have to do these kinds of things and the products weren't available anyway. Right. Exactly. If they had a problem, they had a problem. Now there's so many resources out there. We can fix a lot of things in houses. We got enough things can go wrong with our health without something that we could have prevented pretty easily. Exactly. That's a shame in all these sad stories about how people live a wonderful life. And at the very end, they spend their last year or two in pain and misery and unhappiness. And I fear, hate that. And fear. Right. Fear of yeah. falling. Well, uh, how do they get in touch with you if they don't want to be afraid of these things anymore? If they want to take a step toward the right direction and explore taking that house and turning it into a forever home taking that house designed for young families and making it fit an aging person or couple. How do they find yeah. you? Marisol, please. Sure. There's several formats that um, your audience could connect with Dave, um, either visiting our website at homesafetyadvisors.net. Home, you broke up a little bit. Home Safety Advisors, all one word, Home Safety Advisors. Homesafetyadvisors.net, and I'll repeat the dot .net. <laughs> Not right. dot com, right. and phone number nine four nine four five six four seven one seven. Okay. We are also on social media because we do, and you and you mentioned like everybody's in denial, so we want to bring awareness. Uh, yeah. We do a lot of um, networking with health healthcare professionals. Uh, we do blogs, um, events. Uh, you will typically see us like at an Alzheimer's event with our booth, our table, right. and trying to reach out to these people. I mean, um, and you don't have to be old. I mean, there's people with um, yeah. health issues. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we just um, recently had one of our close friends for 20 years. He lives in Florida, and he was having a lung is uh, a lung issue where it would fill up, you know, the, the fluid fill up his lungs, right. and he would pass out. And he, oh. for somebody to get to him, he lives in a remote area. He could have definitely. Um, I almost want to say I kind of kicked myself because we were in talks of getting a fall alert to him, but it was a little too late. So he passed away on his second fall in less than two he weeks. Died from a fall. That's he, what he, killed. Yeah, he, he passed out, hit his head on the bed and yeah, he passed out. Well, my late father, the big strong bomber pilot who, who flew through every other health crisis in the world and like it was nothing, heart attacks, strokes, uh, cancer, what killed him was a fall. That was, that was what finally did him in. And I'm telling you, the power of a fall, uh, the fear of a fall, and the, and the complications of a fall are not to be ignored, but we do. And I'm included in that. As much as I saw this, no, I don't have grab bars. I'm still thinking I can lean out and clean the pool. I'm still taking shortcuts. I'm still... You know, it makes me in my own mind think I should be calling you guys here. I should be going through this stuff here because we don't do enough until it's too late. That's the message I give everybody. And then we wonder, why didn't we? Don't wait anymore. Don't wonder. Call them today. The number again is what? Home Safety Advisors. And what's the phone number again, Marisol? 949-456-4717. I hope your phone lights up. I hope we get a lot of people because, boy, one little simple effort like this can save a lot of misery and fear and problems and pain and maybe save your life. It's that serious. That's right. And Paul, I'll, I'll finish with one more thing on the outreach. If any other medical professionals want to uh, talk with me, meet with me, we'd love to get involved with more medical practices like Caduceus. I think that's a good point because I, I, I'll, I'll emphasize, I will go one minute longer here. As my parents and my aunt went through all this, I only person I knew to talk to was their doctor. I'd take him to the doctor yeah. and I'd take him aside and I say, what do I do? And their first answer is put them someplace. And I say, one, they can't afford it. And two, they don't want it. So what's your next option? And they'd shrug. I don't know. I'm a doctor. Right. I, I have no idea. I, I don't know why they couldn't hand me some pamphlets, why they couldn't send me to a site, why they couldn't right. say, well, go check this out. Here's some quick ideas. Here's some safe fall alerts. Here's some, somebody come out and assess their house. We can reduce the risk. I'm, I'm telling the, I just told your father, I'm worried about him falling. 
here. Why don't you take these steps then if you yeah. are going to stay there? That's that's what we're trying to keep that going. We're trying to propagate more of that. Yeah, because that's the point. That's the only place I go. And the doctor shrugged and said, I don't know. And then time was up. Well, our time is up too. Thank you for joining us. And uh, what a great yeah. conversation. Uh, what a timely conversation. And it reminds me again, I'm no better than my parents. I'm putting it off for another day. Make the phone call. Find out what you need to do today. Thank you so much, Dave Riggles. Thank you. From thank Home you. Safety thank you, Dr. Advisor. Trin. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. All right. Well, there you have it. Some real life conversations make you really think twice about what we're doing. Simple stuff. Don't fall. But do come back each and every week to hear more of the ideas as we try and explore a healthier life, a longer life, a better life here on Health Talks with Dr. Trim. Streaming live from our studios here at the University of California, Irvine's Beal Applied Innovation Center.